Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Tech Point. Today, I'm here with Andrew from Exo Capital. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Uh, please tell us uh, what does your company do. So, Exo Capital buys and operates uh, SaaS companies. So, uh, effectively, we we go out and we buy. We try and buy really great products from you know one or two solo founders or a small team. Um, sometimes they've raised money, sometimes they haven't. And for various different reasons, they want to move on to a different project or um, take a little bit of cash off the table or they just, you know, want to sell it for other reasons. And um, so, yeah, we buy it, we take it over 100% and then we continue operating it. So we've done that six times so far. Mm -hmm. um, we've sold one and we currently operate five companies. Nice, nice. And uh, do the do the founders have to stay in after the acquisition? No, we generally do anywhere between like uh, you know three months on average is how long I would say a transition really takes to where we're just you know there's always one or two passwords somebody forgets to transfer or <laughs> oh wait uh, how does this thing work right and we forgot to document it or something like that but they are not asked to contribute in any meaningful way during that transition period other than documentation and knowledge transfer. And I'm curious, what's what are the most important factors when choosing uh, a SaaS for you? To buy? Mm -hmm. Yes. So in a lot of ways, we are still figuring that out. One insight that our team had last week as we were looking at a new deal that is in the low seven figures, so this would be a larger deal for us, is that size does not necessarily dictate product market fit. So okay. for example, we have a company called sheet.best and it is a very simple wrapper around uh, the Google Sheets API. So if you're a developer and you want to quickly put some data in a spreadsheet and have that render in your application, you'd use sheet best to do that. Mm -hmm. That product had product market fit when we bought it and it was only doing you know, seven, $800 in MRR, right? Uh, that I wouldn't say is, is typical. It's not typical that you find a product making that little amount per month that has product market fit, but it was so specific. It was so niche and it was largely done by the time that we bought it. And we haven't had to uh, continue building new features uh, as frequently as we would, I think, if we were pre-product market fit on that product. Okay. Um, now, contrast that to another company we're looking at um, buying. They are doing about $20,000 a month. And I would say that they do not have product market fit. They do not have a kind of single buyer that's identified, right, who is going to be purchasing this, this software. They do not have a um, built-in way to reach them. Uh, and they do not have a repeatable sales process. <laughs> Even though it's, you know, 10, 20 times bigger than Sheet Best, it's still, I would say, does not have product market fit. So um, that's not to say that that's what we look for when we're buying companies. I think at the beginning, uh, which I, I still consider 18 months in as a beginning, we're still figuring out where the best opportunity is. Sometimes it's buying stuff that's um, pre-product market fit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, ideally, it's buying stuff that is post-product market fit that um, is just on a growth trajectory. That's ideal for us, of course. Um, but those are difficult to find. Um, so we've been pretty opportunistic so far in discovering what is going to make it in the portfolio and what won't. Um, and it's largely just a matter of what, what precedes that purchase. So if we buy something before it, for example, I think that that heavily influences what we buy next, because it might be oh. an adjacent market. We don't know that much about, right. We learn about it. And then we say, oh, we're now comfortable with these types of opportunities. And it kind of expands our worldview, so to speak, of what we what we think we can acquire and, and operate successfully. So you try to remain as flexible as possible for now and uh, find the path, uh, <laughs> see what works. Yeah, part of part of that is because if you just look at the market, like if you go on micro acquire or, you know, microns, whatever, all of these different marketplaces that list these products for sale or these companies for sale. There's not that many of them. So when we first started out, we were very narrow in our focus. We we're like, we're only going to buy XYZ tool. And there were exactly zero tools that met that criteria. And so we didn't end up buying anything for like three or four months. And we, we said, this is stupid. Let's widen our, you know, 
uh, search. And um, yeah, ever since then, we've been a lot more opportunistic. Mm -hmm. And I saw that uh, you, people can also invest with you. Can you explain to us how that works? So we have been experimenting with bringing in outside capital. Uh, so far, we have only been using our own capital. So it's three founders and we own the company. We own 100% of, of the company, uh, including we. So, so each of the companies has no debt, right? We just own it all outright. Um, that's only going to last so long, right? We can't continue to operate in that way forever. And so at some point, we're going to start bringing in outside investors. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't yet. So that is mostly that page is mostly a, um, a way for us to have interesting conversations with uh, potential LPs or limited partners, the people that invest would invest in us. Uh, but we haven't we haven't done anything with that yet. Mm -hmm. Understand. And how do you see the SaaS uh, industry in the upcoming months? <laughs> It's going to depend for us. I, you know, there are a few products in our portfolio that are pretty mission critical to the businesses that we sell to. Mm -hmm. I don't see that. I don't see this current economic environment having an adverse effect on those companies. What is concerning to me is, for example, well, we've been speaking about SheetBest, so let's continue down that one. SheetBest can be a critical you know, backend tool for a company, depending on how they use it. It can also be something that isn't as critical, right? You might be using it just to, you might've just used it to speed up development six months ago. Um, in a, in a, I don't know, for whatever your application was. And maybe that's not that critical anymore, but it was six months ago, but 20 bucks a month is now meaningful to you, right? Whereas six months yes. ago, it, it wasn't so meaningful. So we haven't seen any, any real change so far. But mm -hmm. we're bracing for, you know, the worst case scenario <laughs> as as you have to do. Cause yeah. I, I you know, XO is XO is bootstrapped. Um, so all of these companies were trying to run profitably. And uh, that's always just difficult to do in any economic environment. And uh, you've also built a SaaS product yourself, uh, talking about uh, cold email studio, right? So Cold email is actually, and this is my the first time I've done this. My background's in just software, but product, uh, cold email studios is a productized service. So uh, we do cold email as a service, mostly for YC, Y Combinator startups. That's most of our book of business. Mm -hmm. um, it was my first foray into a productized service where we're delivering, you know, human labor, right, in in a kind of packaged way as opposed to software, and it's been amazing. It's been amazing. The um, CEO, his name is Mikey Howe. He's been doing an incredible job over there. That's also another business where I think um, it's possible that, that this current economic environment could impact that business as well. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, people use us because as a young company, you're not always comfortable hiring a new employee or a new team, right? Because those are those are fixed costs to you. It's, it's, it's harder to get rid of uh, an employee than it is an agency, right? Um, yes. so I could see it kind of going both ways where, uh, because we're a flexible cost, our business might not be impacted, right? Because instead of a company hiring a fixed cost full-time employee, that's probably going to be more expensive than we are. Um, yes. they may choose to use us because then they can cut us. I mean, you know, not ideally they won't, but right. Like that's, <laughs> that's kind of the it mentality. Um, yeah. so again, we haven't really seen anything negative on, on that business either, but again, I think we're, we're kind of, we might be just at the beginning of, of this new economic environment. I understand. Um, and tell us more about it. How does it work? Uh, what are the, the top features? <laughs> so normally at the beginning of a, let's say a B2P SaaS journey where you're trying to go to market and figure out how to acquire, let's say your first hundred customers, or if it's an enterprise product, your first, you know, one really, um, Normally, that process goes like this. You're the founder of the company. You start pulling leads. Uh, you start writing emails, right? And you start sending them. Yes. Um, it, it's not, it's, you know, it's not a very sophisticated approach. And it, it will yield some kind of data, right? And that data will lead you, lead you down a trail to adjust your messaging or adjust the market that you're going after or the ICP that you're trying to target. Um, 
I worked at a venture studio for a number of years and we just saw this time and time again where these founders were spending uh, an inordinate amount of time doing this work and they couldn't quite afford to hire a full-time employee, right? They didn't, they weren't quite ready to hire like a salesperson um, because that's, that's a classic mistake, right? Is you hire a salesperson when you have zero sales to (laughs) solve your sales problem. And that's not the right way to think about when to hire a salesperson, right? Hiring a salesperson you should happen after you as the founder have already like forged the path towards at least a few sales. And the salesperson is repeating a process that you've set up. But I generally haven't seen it work so well when that salesperson is, is meant to set that process up. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's typically more of like um, the, the, the CEO's role, let's say, in a sub 10 person company. So yes. Cold Email Studio takes that um, workload off the founder. You know, and we just take it all. We do the uh, lead hunting. We write the email copy um, and we do the email sending. And then we also do do follow ups and check the inbox. Right. So that the founder is then only handling warm leads. Um, There's actually so, of course, we use a bunch of different software in the back end to to deliver that service. Right. Um, But, you know, at the end of the day, it's a lot of just human labor. So there's about 15 full time people and you know, even as a software developer myself, the, you know, one of the key insights I found is that like, there's no real corners to cut when it comes to this stuff. You really just have to put the work in, right? It's, it's anybody can go pull a long list of leads of recently funded companies or from Apollo or LinkedIn, whatever. But it's, it's actually doing the work of narrowing down that list into exactly who would be perfect, right, to reach out to. And if you really had everyone in, in this list in a room, all of them would be a great fit for your product, right? Doing that work takes a lot of time. And then just, you know, week over week when you send out like, okay, we, you know, nobody's opening the email, right? So maybe let's, let's maybe test our subject lines a little bit better and then figuring out, figure out what the best approach is. Um, that work just takes a lot of time. And um, that's what Cold Email Studio does really well. And then actually recently, we for the first time so we're 18 months in um, okay. and we just built our own uh, email sending tool uh, it's in beta right now it's called super send but we've been using it at, on the agency side to do all, this, all the sending for our customers and um, yeah we think we've built a, a pretty great tool so in that sense that's also kind of funky too because with a productized service right typically um, that software, like we were using Lemless a lot and we were spending, you know, $3,000 a month, $4,000 a month on mm-hmm. Lemless. Yeah. So at that point, it made a lot of sense for us to just build our own just purely to get rid of that cost, right? Or make that cost <laughs> lower for It makes ourselves. sense. It makes sense. Yeah. So you tried using Apollo or Lemlist and you said uh, it's better to build, uh, build a product yourself. Part of it was cost about why we did it. Part of it was after being real power users of these tools, mm-hmm. we found product gaps is, is, is really the answer. And so we feel like we're building a product that fills those product gaps um, for us first as an agency and then, um, you know, trying to sell to other agencies. And then, of course, individual salespeople can, can use it as well, just like Lemless. But um, that's how great products are born, <laughs> right? That's what they say. That's what they <laughs> say. But, you know, I think for your audience, one of the relevant pieces is that, um, you know, I think a lot of people have, have very weird understandings of, of what it takes to build a company or, or, or how innovative they need, need to be to build a new successful SaaS product. And I think Supersend, fingers crossed, will be a great example of a case where the innovation was really kind of minor, right? Mm-hmm. Um Email sending tools have been around for a very long time. Yes. Um, we have a, a particular perspective on email sending tools just because of, of how much volume we do, right? We're sending a ton, a ton of emails uh, and managing all these things, right? And then being really metrics driven about it. Um, there's not a lot of pro- true engineering innovation there, right? We're not going to be writing any patents on that product. It's going to be the you know, 65th email sending tool on the market. <laughs> and I still think that we'll be able to build a a successful small business on the back of just SuperSend, just the email sending tool as a standalone SaaS product. So it's always important to keep in mind, like you don't always need to think of some crazy rocket that's going to land on Mars to build a great company. You can, you can build a great lifestyle business um, 
just innovating in, in small ways. Yeah, I think it's a it, it's it's a good lesson for founders to understand that uh, there's a there's space uh, in there, so you can build a product yourself and uh, yeah, <laughs> because uh, yeah, as you and... said, most people try to uh, find uh, rocket ships. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I mean, what what's the biggest risk when you go to start a new company? It's that nobody wants the thing that you built, right? When you're building something that already exists and you're building a variation on that you don't have to worry about uh, is there a market for this exactly. right you just totally eliminate market risk so we're, we've eliminated market risk we've eliminated uh execution risk on the technical side right there's there's not a lot of uh reasons i could think of why an engineering team couldn't build this that's not the case with a rocket to mars right Okay. <laughs> um, there's a there's a ton of execution risk. So again, eliminate market risk, eliminate execution risk. It's really just about your ability to build a, a brand in in this space. Uh, and for any given you know product like Lemus, which has hundreds of thousands of views, I don't know, maybe millions now. I don't know. Um, there's going to be dissatisfied customers. Absolutely. Finding them, communicating your your different value props is is a surefire way to to get started now. If you want to go build that rocket ship, do it later. I, I always encourage first-time founders to just build something, um, build kind of a variation or a, a take or a point of view on a product that already exists. I think that that's a much surer way to success than um, trying to create a new market, which is a pain in the ass, takes a lot of money. That's typically <laughs> the realm of venture capital. Um, if you're just a bootstrapped you know, solo founder, you have one or two people Um, I would absolutely encourage you to take that viewpoint as opposed to trying to do something crazy or, or huge for your first time. Yeah, uh, you, you shared some great value. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious about your background because uh, you said that you're a developer, right? But you're also very passionate about business, about entrepreneurship, about uh, founding companies. So I'm, uh, I'm curious to know about, uh, about your story. Sure. I... I'm a Berkeley graduate. I studied econ and computer science. So I've kind of always been interested in building things, but also building things in a practical way, right? The, okay. the, the My least favorite feeling as a developer is building something that nobody uses, right? I just get no joy out of building <laughs> stuff that nobody wants or nobody is going to end up using. So um, I started a company after, after college that uh, did not work out. Um, but I landed a job at a, a venture studio in, in LA and, and I eventually became the CTO of that venture studio. Um, and then I eventually became CTO of one of our portfolio companies. And um, after we, we sold the assets off to that business, that's when I started Exo Capital and um, Cold Email Studio. I kind of started them at the, at the same time. So I always just, you know, pretend like they're under one umbrella, but they're, they're, they're actually two separate companies with with separate uh, uh, co-founders etc okay okay um and how, how did you come with uh, how, how did you come to meet with why come founders i know uh, are they your your target for uh, cold email studio so in some ways they're the target for both exo capital and cold email studio so okay <laughs> when we, yeah. Yeah, when we <laughs> when we buy companies, we have bought two YC companies that have, or two YC graduate companies. Um, we're looking at another one right now, actually. And um, you know what? I, and this is this is in some ways what happened to me when I was CTO of our, our portfolio company. Um, we raised eight million dollars, right? A lot of money. Uh, we had a a, a fast growing team, fast growing burn. Right, everything looked really promising, and we kind of fell off that venture track. And when you raise that kind of money and you're on that venture track, if you miss, typically that means the company dies. Right, you ran out of money, uh, you didn't meet the next goal. You know, no VCs would give you any more money to keep trying to keep going, and so you you typically just kind of shut down the business. And and you know, the VCs write it off as a loss. You as the founder get nothing everybody kind of parts ways. I think that there's a new opportunity to take those companies that fell off the venture track, but still have built something of value 
right? You don't spend $8 million on engineering and build nothing of value, I hope, mm -hmm. right? There should, be, there should be something there that's salvageable. And so our thesis is that there are a lot of these companies that, that uh, went on a venture track that maybe should not have. And so um, we try to, when we buy companies in, in, in that, are, that fell off, um, try to provide some kind of funding for, for the team or the founders or, right, it, it ends up being, okay, great, you know, like we didn't make it to the next venture round, but we exited, we sold the business. Um, here's the product today, right? It's still, it's still in existence. People are still selling it. And so we take it off their hands and continue operating it and growing it. Um, so in that way, YC founders are sort of the target for Exo Capital for Cold Email Studio. I mean, it's, it's very straightforward, right? Yeah. Um, these founders have been doing founder sales probably before they got into YC or, or, or just, you know, they, they had to show something that was yes, sort of working, yes. right? To get there. Um, and this is the same for tech stars or really any other accelerators, which we also work with. They just got a little bit of funding. They've been doing this work. Okay. It's actually time to start building a, a, a business where the CEO is not doing a billion things, right? It's time to start hiring uh, people or, or uh, services to go fill those roles so that the founder can actually work on building the business itself. And it's, it's, it's a pretty straightforward sale to say all the things that you're doing as a founder right? That's what we're experts at taking off your plate. Um, you know, here's 50 companies we've worked with and done that for. Uh, how nice would it be to wake up tomorrow and like task us with doing this crappy work instead of you doing it? Oh, doesn't that sound so great? And and um, and then we try and do obviously the best job we can to get them as many meetings and as many, many leads as possible. Well, uh, thank you so much, Andrew. I love the discussion. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, is there anything else that uh, that you want to share with us today? No, I think that's it. Thanks so much for having me, Fish, and I appreciate it. If anybody has any questions, you can always reach out to me on on Twitter at Andrew Pierno, P I E R N O. Yeah, uh, links are below, and uh, I'm grateful. I I really learned some new things, and uh, I'm confident that people uh, also will. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Christian. Have a great rest of your day.